Before we get into today's episode, I want to thank a couple sponsors that we were able to secure for this season, uh, season five of the Scuttlebutt. It's exciting to be able to get sponsors for this. Uh, we're really thankful for them. Uh, the first, we'd also like to thank a new sponsor for the Scuttlebutt, Tobacco Free Adagio Health. Tobacco Free Adagio Health is dedicated to preventing and reducing tobacco use and increasing education about tobacco hazards and secondhand smoke. Of course, the best way to be tobacco free is to never start. And we'll be sharing more about the many programs offered by Tobacco Free Adagio Health in the future. You can check out more of their work at tobaccofree.adagiohealth. That's A D A G I O health.org. Tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. Org. Um, really excited to have sponsors on board uh, for the Scuttlebutt, and uh, I hope you enjoy this upcoming episode. So we help brothers, we help veterans expand their resume and their portfolios. If mm -hmm. that's what you're looking to do, that's what you can do at a local level. You can be that court president. You can be that vice president. You can be that media coordinator. And these refine and utilize the skills that you've gained into the military, and you convert them within the private sector. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Scuttlebutt. I'm your host, Sean Hall, Director of Programming with the Veterans Breakfast Club, whose mission is to create communities of listening around veterans and their stories to connect, educate, heal, and inspire. Uh, if you have been a longtime listener of The Scuttlebutt, welcome back. If this is your first time, please like, share, subscribe, ring the bell on YouTube, and also connect with me. You can do that through Sean, S-H-A-U-N, at veteransbreakfastclub.org. We're always interested to hear from our audience uh, about their thoughts or comments on the subject matter. Uh, and since we're also connected with VBC, the nonprofit, we also like to do other nonprofit spotlights. Uh, and this being uh, one for season five here, really excited by our two guests today from Mu Beta Phi uh, Fraternity. We're gonna hear all about the fraternity, um, but also hear a bit about both of their service, uh, Gary and Greg, it's so uh, it's so awesome to have you guys aboard for this episode of the podcast. I want to go around the room and have you guys introduce yourselves. Uh, Gary, if you if you'd like to go ahead, um, yeah, welcome to the welcome to the show. Yes, and uh, thank you very much, Sean. And um, and yes, uh, I am I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Gary Ammons. I am uh, one of the founders of uh, Mu Beta Phi Military Fraternity. Uh, I served 22 years in the United States Navy as a senior chief and a uh, avionics technician. Um, and once I retired, I, I started working for the uh, Navy and for the Coast Guard as a flight control engineer and, and currently serving as a curriculum developer um, in the instructional systems design uh, division. And, um, and pretty much, uh, you know, I occupy my time uh, with Mu Beta Phi, um, founding the organization, just trying to create a brotherhood of men that want to continue to serve the, the community, serve our country, um, and help veterans and also active duty through mentorship, scholarship, and um, you know education. So uh, that's pretty much that's pretty much about us. You know, it's real simple. You know, just a brotherhood trying to continue to serve. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Gary and Greg. Uh, welcome to the show. I I know, right? Oh, I like this. I like the Veterans <laughs> Breakfast Club room. I'm down with you, Sean. Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Greg. Hi. Williams. Uh, I am the National Media Director for Mu Beta Phi Military Fraternity Incorporated, the number one military fraternity in America. See, Gary, he's just, he's one of the founders. He's humble. I'm not humble. Uh, we are the 2021 recipients for the Most Outstanding Community Service Award, which was awarded to us by the Professional Fraternity Association. So we beat out the bands, we beat out the dentists, we beat out the medical fraternities, we are the number one professional fraternity as far as community service in America. A little bit about me, uh, I served in the Army Reserves where I deployed twice, Afghanistan, Africa, doing combat operations, doing a little bit of civil affairs, transportation, public affairs, you name it, I've done it. Um, and I had so much fun, you know, during my time uh, in, in the reserves and being activated on missions. Got to go to Slovenia, Macedonia, um, all of these great places, uh, you know, doing missions and telling the army story or working with the uh, 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 non-governmental organizations and other nonprofits to help stabilize the civil populace so that you know we can go inside as a military force and do what we have to do to build relations and you know help our host nation partners so 
definitely my role within Mu Beta Phi is not just, you know, heading up the media department, but I host our podcast, The Finer Life, you know, which if you just Google The Finer Life, but it's not F-I, it's P-H-I, you know, like Mu Beta Phi, <laughs> P-H-I. So yeah. it's The Finer Life show and you can find us on spotify iHeartRadio, uh apple podcasts google plays you name it we're on it and i'm so great to be here i've wanted to be on vbc for a while and uh i did it i made it mama Woo! hey you guys it's everything's coming up you beta fi uh which is fantastic news um to start before we dive into sort of what and began you beta fi uh gary tell me a bit about your service navy uh you were in for quite a while what made you what made you enlist so yeah so um so yeah so my, my family we we come from a uh or i come from a family of military service my, mm -hmm. my grandfather he was in the army uh my brother he was also in the navy and um i've always looked up to him so you know that, i just figured i'd, I'd follow him uh, i started off in college at florida a and m um, and then I, I had to come back home after my freshman year, and then I decided to join the uh, the Navy. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I loved it, so I stayed. You know, I was one of those guys that was like, I'm four years and I'm out. Um, but then, as I, I loved it, and they started throwing money at me and stuff, I decided to stay. And four years turned into 22 years, and you know, and so it, I was, you know, I was blessed with a, a really good and promising career, and 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 it's you know, help me in my lifestyle these days. And it get, allows me to give back um, to the community and to service members. So um, that's pretty much what started me and what, what helped me to make the decision to become a, a Naval service member. Nice. What was your MOS and what ships did you serve on? So so for the Navy, we don't go by uh, MOS. Um, Good point. My, my, yeah, it's a Navy, uh, uh, what is what? Navy occupational code, that's what we call it, um, mm -hmm. or NEC type of thing. So I was what you call the aviation electronics technician. Mm -hmm. So um, inside that um, rating or that job description, I was what you called a um, uh, automatic carrier landing systems um, technician. That's what I started off as. Um, but then as I moved up, I, I was uh, the leading chief for the production control division. And then in the latter part of my career, I walked, I, I went over to the schoolhouse and I became the learning standards officer, the, um, the LCPO for the training division. And, um, you know, I ran the schoolhouse for the Navy for aviation maintenance courses. Fantastic. Um, what was it like being in for 22 years? You've retired. Congrats. Uh, it's, you know, that's, that's quite a long career. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's just like any other career field or any other thing that you have longevity in yeah. it has its good days and bad days, but I definitely would say it had more good days than it had bad. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I met a lot of people that I would have never met living in my neighborhood in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it definitely broadened my scope um, on, you know, personalities, uh, different ethnicities and, um, you know, lifestyles and things like that. Um, but also from a leadership standpoint, it taught me how to deal with different personalities mm -hmm. and how, you know, to keep yourself flexible and open, uh, you know, for your service member that may need you for help or assistance and trying to find the right answer to get them where they need to be. Did you get a lot of time to travel with the Navy? Uh... Yep, I did. I did. Uh, I deployed seven times in my career. Hmm. Um, I've been everywhere from Southeast Asia. To the Mediterranean. I've been to Brazil, Dubai, uh, Japan, Brazil, you know, um, I, I've been to many different places. So I definitely am not complaining, you know. <laughs> Did you have a favorite? Uh, oh, yeah. Dubai was was my all time favorite. Well, no, I take that back. Perth, Australia was my all time, but then Dubai will be like 1A. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and Greg, you chose Army. Uh, what, what made you choose to enlist? Uh, you know, I actually joined the reserves on a lunch break. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was working for a movie marketing company at the time. And one of my brothers from the church, he came in his Army service uniform. And, you know, he walked downstairs. I was like, yo, Ant, that looks cool, man. I didn't know you went Army full-time. He was like, no, I did it part-time. I was like, wait, there's a part-time? Because <laughs> I thought you had to, like, give your life and soul to the military. I didn't know anything about it. But um, 
I was like, oh, and you could get extra money and you get to travel and you get you get, you know, a shot at retirement because I was a struggling actor at the time. So I was actually balancing an acting career and working for a marketing company. And I just went and I joined during a lunch break. And, you know, my family actually, they served in the military. Yeah, here's here's my grandfather. If, if, if I could show it, you know, he served in uh, World War II. And oh, yes, wow. it's Guy. Corporal Bernard Gillian. Yeah, you know, way back in the day, 1943, fighting in the Philippines, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I was just like always looking up to him and always wanted to emulate a piece of his military service is just, you know, I didn't know about, I thought it was the full-time part and I wanted to pursue my dreams. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did, you know, I was successful. I became a member of SAG-AFTRA. I did a couple of movies, Manchurian Candidate with Denzel Washington, Law and Order, Mm -hmm. White Collar, The Blacklist, uh, even got to be on Luke Cage, which which was awesome. Um, (laughs) And it's just kind of like, you know, once I learned about the reserves, I joined and I just loved it. I fell in love with it. And it was just something that I excelled at. And I started gathering MOSs like Pokemon. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I started out in transportation. Then I got public affairs and, and then I got civil affairs. And it's, it was just a crazy ride. You know, I was actually the first ever Meet Your Army Facebook Live host you know, and I hosted an event in Times Square. Wow. It was just, you know, a great ride, you know, pretty cool. So, um, and well, you and I have that have that in common. I have a previous life as an actor as well. So uh, I hear you on all of that. It's great to, to hear. Yeah, all the- people don't know that that once you're a struggling actor, they see the glitz and glamour. They don't know that you had to start out back in the day with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and trying to take food home from craft services. Exactly. <laughs> 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 I hear you. Um, well, you know, uh, Gary, jumping into to Mu Beta Phi, I mean, this is a big fraternity. I mean, you guys have a, a, a lot of praise coming at you guys. You guys are growing in, uh, nationally. You got a lot of members. Tell me about how this idea started, and then out how, as you came out of the Navy, what what made you decide that you want to start this? Yeah. Um, so so yeah, it, it definitely is a history behind the start of Mu Beta Phi. So so for me, um, w- when I divorced from my, my first wife, um, I was just kind of looking for like a brotherhood that I could latch on to and just kind of stay active and keep mm-hmm. my mind in a good place. And so I, I joined uh, another military fraternity and, you know, without going into too much details, it just really was not what I expected, um, you know, with the philanthropy work or, you know, the camaraderie and things like that. So it just didn't work out too well. So I ended up leaving that organization. And then uh, Greg and I both came from another organization as well. And they was even worse than the first one. Um, so, and so sorry to I, interrupt you real quick. I, I, yeah. I didn't know that there were a lot of military fraternities out there. Yes. So, huh. so um, this is a community that is, is up and coming. Um, you know, uh, right now, I believe we're up to 33 organizations. Um, some in existence by name only. Some, you know, they're, um, you know, doing doing some 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 good work in the community and things like that. Um, but yes, uh, you know, with Mu Beta Phi, um, what I said to myself was, um, I was not, if I was going to do anything else, it would not be under the vision of anyone else other than myself. So, mm-hmm. what I did was, um, I, I put together a blueprint and a plan of what I wanted this to look like. Um, what I wanted us to be about. And then um, we did the legwork that was needed to get legal with our name and the incorporation of the organization. And we stood up in 2017. Um, And then uh, what I did was I went out and I found our first 10 members to start the organization. Uh, we, We typically call it our alpha line. And so we, you know, we, we held them for about three months uh, developing our, our, um, fraternal information and, and some of the things that, you know, is important to the organization. And then uh, I, I want to say it was July of 2017, we inducted our first 10 members. Mm-hmm. And so from there, we just continued to, be- uh, to develop the vision and, and uh, the, the reasoning behind the organization. 
and uh, what we wanted to be about and what we wanted to look like. And uh, in 2017, we inducted, I believe, 48 members. Um, and each year it has just grown. Um, this previous year, we inducted 131 members. Um, and so, you know, we're, where we currently sit at in year five, um, we have 13 chapters across the United States, two um, charterings going on overseas, one in um, Germany, one in uh, the Persian Gulf region. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we have brothers, you know, all over the world, you know, um, you know, United States, uh, Southeast Asian region, the Mediterranean and European region, and the Persian Gulf region. So we just continue to, to, to push the brand and, and what, what we're here for, and it's worked well in our favor. And before we get into the chapters, uh, and congrats on the expansion of this, a uh, very fast expansion, what is the like the, the primary goal of Mu Beta Phi, the, the mission of the organization? So sure. Um, and so as as I tell all the members, um, everything we do in our organization is is really up under our two national programs. Um, my other founding brother, who's out in the, um, the Chicago area, he and I sat down. We developed our two main initiatives. One was the mentoring of youth, and the other was the assistance of uh, veterans and, and specifically homeless veterans. Mm -hmm. And so what you have is you have our, our Mighty Warriors program and um, our Herculean Effort program. And, um, you know, what we try to tell our members that, you know, everything we do out in community is to help the veterans that, that need assistance that don't know about the veterans affairs or benefits or how to apply for benefits but also those that are suffering from substance abuse issues, um, being able to, to put them in front of someone um, who can clinically help them, um, you know, and, and try to get them support in, in the services that they need. Uh, but then you have our youth um, side of the house, which is where we have, um, you know, a lot of families that come from single home families, you know, it could be um, someone, you know, was killed in action during war, um, or, you know, the, the, one of the two parents are deployed constantly. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we keep our hands on those youth mm -hmm. and try to help mentor them, um, put them in position to be uh, strong ambassadors in the, in the civil community as they get older, but also help them with educational needs through grants um, and through scholarships that we provide uh, to those young men um, that may be in need. What did you learn about leadership in the Navy that has helped you with Mu Beta Phi? Oh, uh, you know, that's actually a great question. Um, you, you know, depending on what you do in your job at a very young rank or a very junior rank, you, de you start developing those leadership skills. And um, what, it, what, what it then turns to is finding someone that you can look to for mentorship. And so I've been blessed throughout my 22 years to always have a good mentor over top me top of me to tell me how to do certain things. And as a Navy chief, um, you know, we have a motto, it's called ask the chief, but you have to look deeper than that, which is, you know, you can ask the chief, but is he going to give you an integrable answer? And is he going to give you the right information and put you on the right road? So the biggest thing that I've learned is always be authentic, always be flexible and, um, and organic in the way you do business. And what that means simply is, if a sailor comes to me in need, if I don't have the answer, be transparent enough to tell him or her, you don't have the answer, but you, you'll, you know, you'll come back and find it. And so a lot of times it puts you in a position to actually research, do your homework, read and understand, um, you know, what you're getting ready to give to this, to this sailor that's in need. And it has been absolutely the most rewarding part of my career is being able to help a sailor in need, help them in their promotions, help them in their personal life, but also being flexible and understanding that things change like the wind in the military. You know, you can come into work one day and they'll tell you, hey, you're deploying or you're, you're going to detachment for three months and then you don't even have a chance to kiss your family goodbye. You know, you just come into work and you're gone. So you, you always have to be flexible. That way you can kind of sustain through stressful environments. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, and, and I think that's the, one of the biggest uh, tools I have in my tool bag is, you know, I, I'm, I'm a very flexible person, but also, you know, you can lead calmly, um, you know, to your to your people that you're in charge of. So that's what I use. 
Speaking of that changing, like the wind, I'm guessing you served over the course of when 9-11 happened? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was in when 9-11 happened. How did your service change from what you thought it was going to be before that to, to after 9-11? Um, a lot more deployments. Um, so, so, you know, 9-11 happened. Um, President Bush at that time, uh, he, he changed things from, you know, focusing on Iraq to what we call the global war on terror, mm -hmm. which um, put a lot of uh, the military, um, you know, Greg, you know, he's army. So a lot of, a lot of the stressful environments the army was going into um, because they were undermanned, they had to augment a lot of their jobs off to the other services. So, you know, I, I did an individual augmentee tour over in uh, Baghdad, um, you know, and so we deployed a lot heavier and we, we, um, we did a lot, of, uh, a lot of diverse deployments with other branches of the services, uh, filling their jobs and things like that. And so I had the opportunity to experience that as well. That was just an interesting thought I had, but, but back to Mu Beta Phi, how did you find the first 10 members of the fraternity? What, what were you looking for? So, so what I looked, well, so, so I found the 10 members um, through my own service. Um, th these were a lot of men that I served with in the military over the years, sailors that had worked for me um, in, my, in my time um, in service. And so what I wanted to do was bring trusted men that I knew had skill sets that could help grow the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and, and basically that's what I did. I, um, I took six people that was on the ship with me, my last ship before I retired. Um, I took them, brought them into the organization. And then two of those found two other members um, and that made, that made four for them. And then the six that I brought in, so that gave us our first 10 initiates. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, what I looked for was strong, integrable brothers with good leadership skills, but also, um, senior and seasoned service, you know, men who have deployed multiple times, you know, and have been in a, in an environment that you, you know, that was stressful and that, you know, you had to be flexible. So that, mm -hmm. that's what I look for with those guys. Everybody sort of can speak the same language that in that way, uh, I'm sure. Yes. Um, Greg, uh, how were you initiated? What did you have to go through to, to become a part of it? So, uh, so uh, as uh, Gary said, <laughs> we were in another organization together. And what was so funny was I was deployed um, when we were in this other organization together. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'll just give a little bit more clarity. So there are, you know, 33, we call it MGLOs, Military Greek Letter Organizations. Hmm. Big shout out to Sigma Phi Psi for starting the whole thing in 2000. The ladies, the lady lioness out up in Texas, got to give them a shout out. They started it and then it started growing and growing. And I want to put this out as a disclaimer because I get this all the time. Are you trying to replace VFWs and American Legions? No. No, not no. at all. No. People have to understand that nonprofits started by veterans within different service eras were designed to help uplift that veteran community for those specific, you know, whether it was pitfalls and gaps that the federal government was not, you know, handling mm -hmm. or to address veteran issues of that time. I myself, I am a member of a VFW. A lot of our members are members of American Legions and VFWs. Mm -hmm. You know, military Greek letter uh, organizations, we are in the age of technology, the 9-11 GI Bill and voc rehab and, you know, getting all of these educational uh, tools that were not afforded to the Vietnam veterans, that were not talked about to, you know, World War II veterans um, and, and is just basically an evolution of mm. organizations that are there to help sustain the veteran community by veterans. So we are not here to replace any organizations. We're just here to simply evolve the process, meet the demands of the veteran population and community and enhance the capabilities to take care of ourselves and to become self-sufficient in a non-governmental aspect. But that so doesn't I say mean all that. Sorry, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say it doesn't it doesn't exclude a certain age group though. You have no. uh, all ages. So my line, oddly enough, Sean, on mm -hmm. my line, there were twenty members. 
Mm -hmm. Our oldest member was 64 mm -hmm. <laughs> and our youngest member was 23. <laughs> so we had this whole age range of just experience, uh, branches, and it was just so rich. And it was so telling of who served during the Vietnam era, who served during Iraq, who is Afghanistan, who never deployed. And that's what I love about Mu Beta Phi. We're so diverse. We have members who are Asian, Caucasian, African American. I mean, you know, Albanian. Yeah, I got to give a shout out to Lightning. You know, hey, got to represent, man. Um, <laughs> and you know, we were so Gary and I. We were in another organization, and different strokes for different folks. That's all I'm gonna say. You know, it's just kind of like you know, working maybe with a nonprofit for an extended amount of time and you don't see the growth mm -hmm. and you say, Hey, let me go over here. And for me, you know, I was with that organization for a while, even longer. And Gary had started Mu Beta Phi. I came off the plane. I'll never forget it. 2017, when he first started it, I came off the plane in Italy because we were coming back home to America. And I was like, Gary, you left what's going on. And he was like, listen, dog, I got all of these dreams. I got to line this up. You have to get away from the nonprofit aspect and go into a business model. Hmm. That's what separates us. Out of all 33 MGLOs, and I show love to everybody, shout out to all MGLOs, only three of them are with the Professional Fraternity Association. Mm -hmm. Only one of them is a member of the Veteran Chamber of Commerce. It's about business at the end of the day mm -hmm. for me. You know, that's what my degree is in, my master's. It's about business and how can we utilize federal funding, federal grants, scholarships to help increase the, the capabilities of an organization so that we can sustain the veteran community. Mm -hmm. So that's why I chose Mu Beta Phi. Uh, just like any Greek, you know, organization letter or any Greek letter organization, there is a system set in place. There is no hazing. We don't do that. All right. There are some members with PTSD. We, no, no, no. We are not breaking out wood, as they would say back in the day. And uh, Gary can speak to more of that because he and that was also another thing that I had to take into account. He is already a member of Phi Beta Sigma, which is Phi Beta Sigma fraternity, which is a great, you know, Greek letter organization, one of the, you know, D9s. And he had that experience. Mm -hmm. So not only are we blending the military experience, the veteran experience, the professional development, the business acumen, um, but we're blending in the Greek letter system so that when we do talk to members and commune with other members of Greek letter organizations, they know we're the real deal. Mm -hmm. You know, we could say the Greek letter alphabet and, and whatever and, and just know who they are. They know who we are and we can just you know, put our powers together like Voltron and make it happen. <laughs> I'm loving all these pop me, culture references, man. That's great. <laughs> and let me, let me, let me, let me kind of jump in here um, to kind of tag on something that uh, Greg said. And, you know, and he, he does a great job, you know, uh, laying out the organization. The one thing I do want people to understand, um, because we, we, we are very diverse in our organization. I think we're one of the most diverse military fraternities that's in this community. But not only that, um, we're not just um, uh, isolated to American armed services. Our brotherhood, um, allied forces have the ability to join. Um, we're getting ready to introduce our Caribbean chapter um, for the Bahamian Navy. We have members that's coming from the Bahamian Navy that's getting ready to join the organization and stand up um, one of the chapters down in the Virgin Islands. Um, but we also have members from other countries. Uh, Albania is one that he, he just spoke on. Um, we have uh, members from Japan. Uh, so, you know, it, it's not a brotherhood that's just central to one race or one branch of service or one country of service. Uh, we really try to build this brotherhood to include all that one, want to be brothers, and then two, want to serve in the communities that they live, reside, and take ownership in. And like I said, that that has been the biggest selling point for our organization, and it has worked out tremendously for us. I got a lot of questions about this, the chapters, but I, it seems like a, an interesting theme sort of develops through each season of the scuttlebutt, and I'm feeling like uh, veteran advocacy is really, is really becoming a theme of season five here. And could you talk to me a bit about 
uh, how MuBeta Phi works within that veteran advocacy field. Greg, you, you touched on that, Gary, I thought you might expand on it. Yeah, uh, I definitely can. And um, this is a great topic because we were just talking about this last night. And so, um, you know, what you, what you typically find, well, I won't say typically, what has been alarming that you find in the military community, um, on average, the national statistic is um, they give a veteran after they exit the active service, they give them a three to five year lifespan mm -hmm. um, through either health problems, uh, suicide ideologies, um, or some other um, accident that may happen. They, they say that we're only going to live five years after our service. Now, when I heard that, my light bulb clicked on. I'm just like, well, why would they say that? And I, and I know for sure I'm definitely going to pass that five years. So, you know, um, so so I say that to say this is that um, we are very strategic in the way we, we recruit our members in our organization. We do look for those that can help in one of the two programs. If, if you have school teachers that love dealing with children, you know, you're a good fit for our Mighty Warriors program. But mm -hmm. um, more importantly, is that that advocacy piece for substance abuse, for uh, mental health issues, for, um, you know, suicide rates and things of that nature. So what we look for is those that are um, certified in certain uh, doctoral practices, um, mental health uh, fields and things of that nature. And so we bring on um, brothers that can actually bring those attributes to the organization. Mm -hmm. And so what you find, um, you know, I have genuine love for each and every member in our organization. So if I see one that I know is struggling, we don't have to outsource. We don't have to take them somewhere that may compromise their position at their job or um, may put them in a situation where, you know, they're unemployed or whatever, whatever have you. We have brothers inside of the uh, inside the organization that can take them on in private practice, keep a confidentiality pro um, policy, but also give them the rehabilitation and the, the care and training that they need um, to, you know, overcome any kind of vice that they may have in their life. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, you know, if it gets too far outside of um, our area of responsibility, then we do have networks and outlets that we can refer to for VA um, services or crisis lines um, or other uh, private practices that we can turn a brother over to or someone that comes to us for help. Great. This is it, it, so it's not so much just diversity in in ethnicity, but diversity in profession and and the Correct. ability to to help anybody who's coming to to the fraternity. Um, how does th these chapters that are uh, international? How does their advocacy differ in their country as opposed to? like Mu Beta Phi here in the States? So, so with that, um, it's, it really starts with our intake um, teaching and education part of one, what we are looking for from them as a brother in the organization and what their responsibility is once they become a member. And what we tell everyone is that you need to be a community advocate. Um, it doesn't matter if it's the United States, if it's China, wherever it may be, whatever country it may be, um, we all have an, an environment of need. We all do. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we do is we take those brothers and whatever skill sets that they come to the table with, we just ask them to utilize it in the community to help better the community. Mm -hmm. And so it's, again, it's one of those things that really has just worked in our favor. You know, we have members that's overseas in Germany that that's working on the base. Um, and they're basically just taking our product and they're, they're working it at that, you know, at that facility on the base. Um, whether it's a beautification project or it's training uh, young men um, through mentorship, um, you know, on the base there and, and things like that, but also in the community as well. You know, um, you know, you're working with allied forces, they have children, so we, we take them and we try to mentor them as much as possible. Speak a bit about the chapters. How, how did it grow this quick, this fast? And, and how, does, how does a chapter grow? How does it get initiated? Yeah, so, so depending on who you talk to, you know, there's different ways that a person can charter. Mm -hmm. I, 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 would, I would like to think that uh, Mu Beta Phi has one of the more strenuous programs 
it will take a, it will take you know a, a group of men to establish a chapter eight to twelve months um, before they can receive a charter. But really, it's about gaining a brotherhood in a certain area. Um, those men feel confident enough that they can um, stand up the brand in that area. And so as long as they have enough members to um, equate to an executive board for, for that chapter, um, we'll let them go through the process. But they, there's, there's uh, wickets that they'd have to meet. There's certain walls that they have to sit at a certain point in time to get through. And I, and I just mean like, you know, um, we have, we call it PQS, personal qualification standards. We have something, a system set up like that, where it has requirements that they have to meet. And some things we put there to make it a longer process so that way they can stop, pause for a second and just understand what they're doing, how they're doing it and how do you get through this wall. And so sometimes it'll take them eight to 12 months to, uh, to gain a charter. And then, you know, uh, once we feel comfortable with them, uh, myself and my other founders will, you know, approve it and we'll, we'll start their chart, we'll sign off on their charter. Greg, uh, starting at the member level, how do you, speaking of echoing Gary here, how does a member live up to the brand? Uh, you gotta, you gotta want it. Um, I came in, you know, I already had experience working in the nonprofit sector. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I'm a very uh, focused person. Let's just say that when I put my mind to something, I want it, I'm going to go get it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you join an organization, um, one thing and Gary will probably be like, strangling me afterwards but we don't like letter wearers <laughs> that's people that join they just want to wear the beautiful memorabilia and all this other stuff they want to wear the letters mm -hmm. and they want to walk around and they don't want to do anything we mm -hmm. pride ourselves on having workers if you have a great work ethic if you want to expand your role within the nonprofit sector you know we have a linkedin page we have uh uh in inter you know, organizational training, mm -hmm. you know, so we help brothers, we help veterans expand their resume and their portfolios. Mm -hmm. If that's what you're looking to do, that's what you can do at a local level. You can be that court president. You can be that vice president. You can be that media coordinator. You can be that intake. And these refine and utilize the skills that you've gained into the military and you convert them within the private sector. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at a membership level, you know, you're going to go through the intake process. You're going to learn about one another, which is very important that it's a it's a Greek letter organizational system that has been here for hundreds of years, you know, uh, and you put that military veteran twist to it, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't judge. And just like the military and boot camp, you all come in at the same level. You all come in with no rank. You learn about one another. You learn about the organization. If anything, I will say that it is very daunting as far as in learning the material from a business perspective, because mm -hmm. that's what it's about. It's about knowing the brand, knowing the goals, knowing the mission, knowing the objective, and finding your niche of where you're going to fit. Mm -hmm. So after you go from there, you go and you look for opportunities within that court, you know, and, and people say chapters, we say courts, uh, you go within that court to look to, to work and see where you fit in. You find your own MOS, you know, <laughs> you find your own line and then you go from there and you grow. So when I joined, I didn't come in being a national media director. Gary knew me and he, you know, he's just like, listen, all right, you're going to start at the bottom just like everybody else. There's no favoritism. Mm -hmm. And I came in and I ground ground running. You know, yeah. I went through, through, you know, membership. Then I went into, you know, a local media coordinator. Then we had elections. I gave my resume. I, I you know, I used to work at BET, MTV, Fox News, guys, my degrees. Here's my photojournalism. And I gained the respect, you know, there were a lot of initiatives. We, we, we're actually one of the few military Greek letter organizations and maybe, you know, Greek organ letter organizations. I don't know everybody, but it is what it is. We were in the streets. We had a whole campaign when the pandemic started mm -hmm. called Kings Against COVID, where we distributed thousands of PPE across the nation. Mm 
Hmm. You know, we mobilize over 300 members within 14 locations, mm -hmm. you know, trying to help save lives and educate people. Uh, we're the only to date that I know of military Greek led organization that we actually participated with the Afghan refugee stabilization. It was called Labor of Love Initiative out there in New Jersey. You know, big shout out to the New Jersey Veteran Chamber of Commerce. You know, uh, Jeff Cantor, retired colonel, got to give him the, 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 the love there. And the VFW that's out there in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, and we created that partnership with, with, local, with other local VFWs and, and, and municipalities. And we helped give clothes to Afghans in need. Mm -hmm. So it's these things like this, you know, uh, also big shout out to U.S. Intrepid out here in New York City. You know, we did a virtual uh, uh, show for veterans around the nation um, to expand our virtual programming. Mm -hmm. It was all of these things that, you know, I brought to the table or I knew that people could bring to the table to help the veteran community that it helped me gain not just status, respect. Right. Because that is what we pride ourselves as members on respect, respect, not only with each other, but within our communities, because you can talk it, but can you walk it? That's the thing. Gary, how does a chapter live up to the brand? So um, Greg hit it right on the head is um, it starts with the work ethic and, um, you know, understanding that uh, our, our model inside our, our fraternity is community first. So before anything else, you know, we can work hard and play hard, but that work piece is definitely at the forefront of what we do. Um, every chapter, every chapter potential president, they understand that they carry that motto into with their with their brotherhood in the local areas. And, you know, what our expectation is to see all of our brothers out in the community um, lending the helping hand mm -hmm. and that and they the men have that understanding and um, not only do they have the understanding it's something that they personally want to do and you know i can't tell you how many members you know they always say thank you for creating a brotherhood because they want to just give back they want to do something positive in the community um, and when you talk about communities like philadelphia new york chicago detroit that inner city piece you know you have men that are hungry to make a positive change in those cities. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've done, you know, and that's what we continue to do. That That is our brand, that is our model, you know, so th that's how it's worked for us. Uh, speak a bit about how does faith become a part of this? How does it play a, a role in, in within Mubitify? Yeah, um, um, and Greg, Greg can attest to this. Uh, one of our objectives is faith. Mm -hmm. um, and so when, when, when we speak on faith as men of Mi Beta Phi, we talk about restoring faith in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what that simply means is that uh, a lot of veterans, um, a lot of veteran families have just given up on the community and uh, in the belief that there is uh, relevant and, and um, substantial help out there for those veterans in need. Uh, our mission objective is restoring the faith in the uh, local and veteran community. So this kind of ties to what we just spoke about is the community seeing these men of Mu Beta Phi, our colors, our, our unity, our uniformity, seeing that in the community, um, being approachable and not just being approachable, being resolute and getting um, the help that's needed. And that rebuilds the confidence that people genuinely care for that miss veteran that's sitting on the street or you know starving from um hunger that they have people that are, are are doing the work in their name and in their honor and so that just boosts their confidence that brings back the faith but also a religious belief there too with our chaplain's corps um we always pride ourselves at, at um speaking at uh community town halls um you know uh making uh, networks and partnerships with the uh, local uh, churches in our, in, our, uh, in our areas and things of that nature. So it, 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 it's all a one fold for us. You know, we really try to just restore the faith in the community. That's awesome. A um, couple more questions for you both, but what do you think is the biggest challenge for veterans that are coming out of service and how does Mubeta Phi help them transition? 
Ooh, I, I'm well, going to take this one. I'm going to take this ahead. one. Let me take this one. Oh, ooh, ahead. okay. Go ahead. So uh, transition. When you talk about transition, mm -hmm. you have to understand that no veteran is the same. Mm -hmm. No service member is the same. You have to look at transition as a whole, and you have to incorporate all of the branches and the policies and the pros and cons because you do have active duty, you have guard, mm -hmm. you have reserve. So you're talking about three systems, three different transitional systems for the citizen sh soldiers or, or citizen sailors, the citizens airmen, the citizen marines, and then active duty. Mm -hmm. So active duty, you know, you're given, you're given a housing stipend, <laughs> you're given a place to live, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, hey, as long as I work, everything's peachy keen, I mm -hmm. get to move every four or five years, you know, hey get to see the world, get paid. And now all of a sudden, oh, I got to pay for rent. What's, mm -hmm. what's a utility bill? What's a cable bill? You know, what's all of, what's all of these things, you know? Wait, mm -hmm. I have to pay taxes on milk now? Because at the commissary, <laughs> it's tax-free, you know? Right. At the next? Wait, it's not discounted? I got to go to Best Buy? <laughs> you know, <laughs> big shout out to Best Buy. Um, <laughs> and, and all of these things, and you have to kind of like relearn how to be self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. And then comes the hardest part with employment. Mm -hmm. How did, did you build your resume during your e ETS class? You know, because they only give you a certain amount of time, maybe a month, a month and a half for transitional, you know, activities, whether you're building your resume, you know, because you have to convert your line or your MOS into something that hopefully somebody in the civilian sector can understand and replicate mm -hmm. and find a place for you within their workforce. Right. So with Mu Beta Phi, you know, we have that rich network of people that have already transitioned mm -hmm. and we take those lessons learned and within our own membership, each one teach one and we build that network. You know, it's a great thing where I can get on my device. I can hit up my line, brother. Hey, you know, how do I build a resume? Do you know anybody that can do that? Do mm -hmm. you know anybody that has maybe a tie into the human resources person at this place? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can't say it now, but we are working on even something larger, you know, um, with some big organizations that have been featured on a final life series. And uh, we're going to partner to help transition service members, not just members, service members into the workforce into the real estate industry, utilizing that VA home loan to its max capacity, mm -hmm. helping them, you know, when they want to get their claims together. You know, we got some mm -hmm. big things down the pipeline. I'm not going to talk about it, but if Gary talks about it, he talks about it because he's the founder. I can't do that. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and also we do have the podcast series where veterans and service members can get the latest and greatest. Uh, mm -hmm. I just talked to the senior vice president of DOD programs uh, at Recruit Military. You know, big shout out, Chris Newsom. Uh, I talked to Baby Garcia, military veterans in journalism for veterans, you know, or service members that want to get into media. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to Jana Williams, who's a veteran service officer about claims. Uh, Jay Alexander Martin, who's a, a honorary member, he is the co-founder of FUBU Clothing, which is a multi-million dollar clothing line mm -hmm. about veteran entrepreneurship. I talked to the uh, former uh, VA secretary, David Shulkin, about organizational leadership skills. So veterans can utilize these tips and these tricks on how to ease the transition period. Mm. But that's about it from my end. Gary can take it from there. I think he's going to be like, Greg, you're headed on the head again. <laughs> Well, you, you know, you did. Hence why I say you're the person for this job. But anyway, um, <laughs> I think Greg, you know, he did touch on a, a lot of important pieces. But for me, my own personal turn on um, take on this, uh, I think with veterans that, you know, exit the service, I think the education and knowledge piece is what's missing. Mm -hmm. um, each branch of the service, uh, we do set up, uh, we call it TAPS class, uh, Transition Transition Assistance Program um, that, you know, you know, I, I would say a year before you exit the service, you'll go through a week-long class and they kind of force feed information into you. But the reality of it is a lot of the veterans that come out of service have no clue on what they're getting into 
and the lifestyle change and the culture shock that they get hit with mm -hmm. uh, when they exit service. And so um, for us, what we try to do um, is try to help them, you know, when it comes to VA claims, VA benefits, what you qualify for. Hey, hey, you, you, um, you don't have a place to stay. Okay, we can go to the VA and we can talk to them, um, write a letter, and they can find you substantial housing, you know, um, based off of certain criteria that you meet. And so that helps uh, veterans, you know, just get on their feet with the basic needs. And, you know, the, what I think is important to take away from this is that um, you would be surprised how many men and women who leave the service and have, uh, you know, for 10, 15, 20 years have been kind of spinning their wheels, getting certain things done because they just did not have the knowledge of how to complete a VA claim or complete a request for allowance um, that's available to the majority of the veterans that we have. And so once, once you start talking to them and start uh, pointing them in the right direction, their eyes open up. And I've, I've even had some members even just cry because they didn't realize they had those avenues open. Mm -hmm. And so like that, for me, that, that is always going to be the answer to the why we as Mu Beta Phi is here. Because if we can take one veteran and just help one veteran and get them off the street, then the mission is accomplished, you know? And do I want to take one veteran off? No, I, I, my, I aspire to help all veterans that's in my realm. But, um, you know, you're doing the right thing if you're able to take at least one veteran off the streets. And, you know, that's the motivating factor there. Last question for you, and it, it kind of bounces right off of what you just said, is how does someone find Mubatify? How do you become a member, transitioning veteran, or uh, what is the best way to reach you guys and, and, and tap into the services that you provide? I'll let Greg ta tackle that one. Oh, he wants, he wants me because on a final life uh, show, you know, I always say, well, if you want to find Mu Beta Five, please log on to www.mbphikings2017.org. That is www.mbp. H I K I N G S 2017.org. And then from there, they can just contact you and, and someone will reach out to them. It's Sean, it's all there. It's awesome. like, you know, yep. they'll go to the about page, they'll see the programs, they'll be like, ooh, ah, I want to do that. Then mm -hmm. you see the membership page. And listen, it's an interview process. We don't want letter wearers, we want mm -hmm. some workers. So if you are a veteran, um, no matter your age, all you need, you know what, Gary, you have to go down to criteria eligibility. I let, I, sure. I gotta let the founder do it. Gotta let him sure. do it. Sure. So, so I can tell you just to get to the front door, you definitely have to have some type of armed service. Um, you need to have uh, what we call a DD-214, which is your, your um, history of service, which tells us what type of service you did. And obviously uh, honorable discharge is what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to serve at least one tour of duty in the military. And then obviously uh, you can apply at that point. Once you apply your, um, your, your application to be processed, you'll go through an interview process to see if you meet what we're looking for and you meet what we, uh, uh, or we meet what, you, what they're looking for. Um, and then from there, you know, uh, basically your intake process will start. Awesome. And let me, wait, wait, I gotta clean it up for my reserve and guard. Now he was, that's primarily active duty. If you served in the Reserve Guard honorably for at least two years, which we know that's only about what, a uh, hundred drills. Uh, yeah, you should be good to go. Uh, one tour of duty, active duty. Hey, listen, for Guard and Reserve, we love citizen warriors. This is for you. You want, you want to get that community service ribbon? This is where it's at. That's another thing. Gary, you didn't talk about us helping get the award, nope. man. Come on. So, okay, I'm going to, Sean, ask him how we do help current service members <laughs> promotion. That's a big key development. <laughs> Go ahead, Gary. Sure, sure. And so, you know, Greg, I definitely thank you for keeping me on my toes. Um, so the, the active duty is an, is a, is an important piece. Um, and we have a lot of senior military servicemen we have master chiefs we have colonels we have uh um captains who all are stakeholders in the uh, the promotion process so what we've tried to do is develop 
internal tra training on, on certain things that you need. Uh, with our community service, uh, each branch of the military has the Military Outstanding Volunteer Service Medal. And so what we push and we challenge our active duty members is to achieve your Volunteer Service Medal. Um, you can do it solely through Mu Beta Phi. Uh, we have people that uh, can that are directors of, of these community service events, but also we uh, we um, initiate the uh, the letters that they need to support the awarding of the award. And um, yeah, we we've had multiple men in our organization attain their volunteer service medal through the service of Mu Beta Phi. So that's a, definitely a, a plus for us. Awesome. So yeah, reserve and guard, same thing. Listen, that's 10, 15 promotion points for that next board. And we all know how hard it is to make at least sergeant, staff sergeant. Yeah, it gets real. Well, I really want to thank you both for taking the time to come on and talk about Mu Beta Phi. This is an incredible organization. I really hope our audience uh, takes this and runs with it because uh, what you guys are doing is really fantastic, a great service to veterans. Um, and it's really awesome to see uh, successes that you guys have already had and I'm sure will continue to have. And we will hope uh, that they will jump over and listen to your podcast as well as that just got off the ground. Um, but uh, again, uh, we want to thank our sponsors, D&D Auto Salvage and Adagio Tobacco Free Health uh, for their support of the VBC and the Scuttlebutt. Uh, gentlemen, uh, it's been an, a pleasure and, a, and an honor uh, to, to be here with you today and to hear your stories. Thank you very much, and thank you for having us. All right, thank you, Sean. And as you know, Gary, we got to end it out. What do we say? You fight, you fight. <laughs> Thanks, gents. <laughs>